good afternoon. It is my pleasure to introduce to the club our guest today, who is Professor Peter Van Tor. Uh, Peter, uh, Professor Van Tor teaches at the uh, Norway Academy of Music. He is a musicologist, theorist, and teaches ear training at the Academy as well. Uh, he's the author of several documents on uh, uh, counterpoint and Partimento, including this, which is a really fascinating text I've been reading. Um, it's called Counterpoint and Partimento, Methods of Teaching Composition in Late 18th Century Naples. And so it's been a pleasure to get to know the professor in this past year and really pick his brain about his knowledge and his research about all this. Uh, so please welcome Professor Van Tor uh, to the club and thank you for visiting us, Professor. So I'll let you take it away now. Thank you, Erickson. Um, yes, I, 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 first, uh, one thing, I, I have just taken up a new position at the University of Örebro in Sweden. So I have, I, I quit it in, in Oslo, actually. Um, oh. <laughs> otherwise, uh, my research is, is about the same things as, as I've been doing for the last 10 years, something like that. Um, my dissertation came out in 2015, and uh, it covers mostly the, the tradition in Naples, um, which is um, the most important center for Partimento pedagogy in, in Italy, although there are other centers as well that have adapted the, these traditions. Uh, since then, I've been working on, on Bologna and, and uh, what, what I would like to, to do today is to, I would like to start with some perspective from, from my point of view on, on uh, the canon and canon pedagogy, how, how it was used um, and how, how canon was, was used as part of a larger uh, curriculum of, of learning and teaching. Um, there are quite a few links between Canon and, and Partimento, and especially the Fugue. Um, um, I, I will talk more about that. This is a source by Luigi Antonio Sabatini. Sabatini was a, a maestro, a very important teacher, actually. Um, he studied with uh, Giambattista Martini who was the same teacher that Mozart had in, in Bologna. And he continued, uh, he, he continued his studies with, with um, uh, Valotti in, uh, in Padua. So he was in Bologna and in Padua, and he, and he became a very, very important teacher. This is one of his earliest printed books. It is called the Elementi. Della Musica. And I ju just, just to show you how, how the very first lessons in music could look like, and take a look at, at the, the squares with the stuff. Okay, the first one is already a canon, a four part canon. Okay. And just all the elements of music, like the names of the notes or, and the syllables, do, re, mi, um, etc., they are presented in the form of canons. Right? So every lesson has some uh, reflection, some information about the history of uh, certain things, but also a canon. So it, it shows that the learning was from the very beginning always done practically. So I, I imagine that you have a group here with uh, students that uh, learn to sing these canons by heart and they put them together and they practice, they practice their voice, they practice um, um, intonation and uh, coordination and singing together. And they also reflect about the elements of, of music. And this goes on. So this is an entire course. Here is a, even a canon for seven voices. Yeah. 
I imagine that there is not so much composition going on yet. So this is this is merely a way to to start learning to sing and to and to learn some basic concepts and elements by practical practical singing, but not necessarily by analyzing the techniques of Khan. There's not so much informa information about that in this particular book. So it's more a way to start learning in a playful way, I would say. And, and it's interesting to see that that is it's particularly canons that are used for this kind of what we could spe speculate why are are canons the the vehicle of 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 information here and i think one of the reasons is that you sing in unison first so there's a lot of uh, yeah you can practice intonation and get everyone in pitch and then becoming independent as a singer. And I think this is still done in, in, in schools to sing canons, to, to get control over singing together in a, in a not too difficult way. Now you see there are only canons actually, it's nothing more than canons. You see? That's very fascinating. Yeah. They're very then, advanced canons as well because they're, they're, they have so many voices and we're, we're dealing with just two voices at the company. Exactly, right now. yeah. Now the second part of this book is about solmization. So when this continues, as this continues, you will see more and more information about how to solmize, right? So singing scales with solmization, and he explains a lot. So this is a very important source for for Italian solmization. And those of you who have uh, seen Nicholas Baragwanat's new book, let's see where is it? The Solfeggio Tradition. He actually quotes uh, Sabatini quite a lot because it's a, it's a very important uh, source of information to figure out how, how did this all work? What did they do? How did they uh, switch from one hexachord to the, to the next one? And this is still all old fashioned hexachordal solmization that Sabatini explains. Okay, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. Also interesting here is the introduction of uh, of uh, chromatic inflections. Now the first note that probably will turn up in a note, in a, in a C major scale will be the F sharp, or also the B flat, and it, it explains what to do. Yeah, here is the B flat, and here is the F sharp. Yeah. So the two, two most important things, in case there is something coming coming from another scale than C major, and it will be probably be the the lowered seventh note, or the or the raised fourth note. Right. Okay, that was Sabatini, 1789. I will show you another important source of canons. This is from, from Naples. It's a collection. I think it is uh, uh, a compilation source of Nicola Sala's canons from the early 19th century, I think maybe from 1810 or 1820. So I don't think it is really, maybe in the 1790s could be. 
1790s. But it's rather late in, in, uh, in Sala's life. If he was still alive, it was late in his, later in his life. Now this source is, is, is also an extremely interesting source of information. Most of the canons, I would say maybe 90% of them um, are canons in unison or in, in, in octaves or in the octave. And there are a few canons in the second. Uh, so the, the canon will, will enter one note higher or lower, uh, but most of them are in unison. And when comparing these canons, um, it is noticeable that there are quite a few um, commonly used patterns in these canons. For example, if we take this one, the number three, and you have a, a cadential figure in the second bar, right? It's a kind of a triadic motive in the beginning, yeah, which is combinable with a, with a cadential figure. And then you have ta but in this case, the ornamented or, or diminished with this figure of four, four notes. But in fact, it's ta da ta da di and here is the cadential figure again, uh, again. And, and the ingredients are so schematic and so, I mean, you could almost say, okay, cadential figure in bar two, cadential figure in bar four, then a scalar figure, up a fourth and then down stepwise. Then you get a cadential figure again. Then you get you get the Doremi schema again. Ta -di 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 -di. Ta -da -da and then there's a little modulation going on. Ah, okay. He prepares the situation for okay, taking the subject, if we call it a subject of the canon, taking it to the fifth tone, yeah, and do the same thing. Yeah. Now, the, the, the amount of schematic information or the amount of, of, of commonly used patterns is so great here that this makes us, um, this suggests, uh, in my opinion, that, that these, these are models for improvised calm. Yeah. And especially when we continue to look at the other canons in the same in the same collection, you will you will find here is another one. Okay, you get tom bom pa da di da dom bom pa da di di dom bom pa di 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 dom dom. Okay, what's going on here? Tom bom pa di 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 dom dom. Bom. 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 <laughs> you see, it's just a scale. It's just a scale with some ornamentations. And so what, what, uh, what Sala teaches his students here is how you can make a canon with a scale and, and breaking it up in certain patterns. And you can do this out on the field. You can take a walk to the mill outside of the conservatory when the sun is shining and you can do it with a group of students, with a group of friends, you can sit in the nature and, and uh, you know? So this is a playful way of socializing with your fellow students. And um, one of, the, one of the, the boys who is maybe leading this could start to try and, and uh, and making a little exposition for a canon. I mean, if you can, if you can conduct it from tone one 
and and make an end. Then there is only one thing left to do, and that is, can you, can you, can you drive to another place? <laughs> yeah. Can you go to the dominant? Can you go to the fifth tone? How do you do that? If you can do it, then you can just repeat yourself and do the same thing. Yeah. And the others will follow. So if you just sing and you tell the others, okay, two beats later, yeah. I sing, you sing after me. And you don't even have, have to have any books with you. You can just, just practice this without anything, you know? So this is a, a very nice way to, yeah, it's a kind of musical game, I would say. Yeah, yeah it's very, would, very fascinating what you're, what you're bringing up here. Um, yeah. It's actually, it's, it's very reminiscent of some of the things that we talked in this club. Uh, we use this kind of, we call it like a wireframe method where we, where I supply a skeleton of a cannon and it is improvised or it is, uh, or it's ornamented upon. Um, and you talked about how you have these scalar structures within. And what we talk about when you design your structure of your, uh, of your cannon, it should always be goal-based. That you, you always have to have certain things that you're aiming for. Um, otherwise, the cannon lacks forward direction, uh, which is which is very similar to what you were bringing up with the, the structure of this. Uh, so it's very exciting to hear that. Yes. So I, I wrote a little article about this stuff, um, which is in a magazine called the Journal of the Alamira Foundation. It's actually a magazine for, for Renaissance music. And they became interested in this because this is, it is a kind of a Renaissance technique that survived uh, until, I mean, this is maybe in the 1760s or something like that. So when I told about this to colleagues who were working on on 16th century music, they said, wow, is it really still going on in the, in the 18th century? You know, they, they thought this was something that was uh, more typical for, for Renaissance music, which it is, but uh, so, and, and in the appendix of this article, I give a few, yeah, here you can see a few of the canons with the patterns and see the similarities now, when you put them under each other, you see, aha, okay, it's exactly the same stuff. So if you learn these basic patterns and you learn to combine in, them in new ways, you can actually do this in, in a few days. It's not very difficult. And uh, I, I also gave a, a little, um, a, a few practical hints, how you, can, how you can practice this with a group. And we could actually try, try to do this. Um, if, we, if, I, if you put, put off your microphones, I, I, can, uh, I can sing and then you just repeat after me. Yeah? So we sing in canon. Okay, we won't hear the canon, but anyway, you will, you will understand what I mean. Okay, the first one, that's what I call a safe start. It's nothing, it's just one tone, but just to show the principle. So if I sing, no, no, then you sing after me. No, no, no. Yeah, just to, to learn that, okay, when you have this sign on the third note, it means that the following part will enter when the leading part reaches this point, okay? We do it once again, just to sing, try to find the same pitch. Yeah? No, 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 no. Right. So now the, the next uh, thing is, uh, is to use the scala semplice, the, the simple scale. The scala semplice is the scale that uses all the main syllables, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, sol, fa, mi, re, do. Yeah? 
So if I sing this one, then when I reach the me, then you start to sing the do, right? So let's go. If maybe I could share my sound as well. Let's see if I share sound, right? Okay, so. Please. Okay, very simple. It just shows that if you just make a scale, you can do this because you will get thirds. Um, the next step would be to see, okay, if we start to make scales, we can't go on forever. So either we, we go back at any point or we could make a, a skip. And the skips we make, we need to think about because we can't make any skip. We need to think about the skips we make. Uh, so in this case, we can make a skip in the opposite direction of a fourth. That we, would be okay. And then you can continue upward. Now the result would be Now, of course, this sounds a little bit boring because there are no, we haven't broken up any, any notes yet. Uh, but it's a way to start and it's the way to show the, the basic structure in the canon, which is very useful. And then, of course, um, we could start higher up in our voice if we start on, on the G on the hard hexachord, then we could make a skip like this. Yeah, what happens here? Well, it's just actually one step up, isn't it? It is from D to E, so this is entirely unproblematic. And it's a way to, to, to lower the tension in the melody and to, to go down in our voices. And it's the same thing in, in D minor, if we start on an A. Etc. Yeah, also a way to go in the op opposite direction and continue descending scale. Now, this is all very stepwise, but it's uh, it's a good way to to learn the basics of improvised canon. Here, this is a way to to create rhythmic variation. So now let's start to break it up. So the the basic pattern of It's actually the one we had previously. Now, if we break it up, it could become something like this. There is a little dissonance going on here, but this is actually taken from one of Salah's canon. So it's, if we would say this is a mistake, then it's not my mistake, but, but Salah's. Uh, it's a way to break up the, the pattern 
anyway, that we had previously. Could become. Right? Okay, the next one. Now, also here we have a do re mi pattern in the beginning. Then a cadential figure. Then this very usual uh, um, figure that is appearing in many, many fugues and, and all kinds of, uh, of instrumental pieces. Yeah, you certainly have heard that appear in, in many sonatas of Albinoni, Vivaldi, all kinds of composers. <laughs> You see, nothing happens. <laughs> it's it's just a repetition of a cadential figure and and playing around with that and making making patterns. Yeah? So if you learn if you learn these basic patterns and how to combine them, you can actually already make a canon. Yeah? So the last one is also taken from from one of uh, Sala's solfeggi. Solfeggio Canons, uh, number 37, also. Uh, let's see. So now, now this, this, ex, this is really an exercise to to see how can we um, apply also dissonances you know, the, and the suspensions. And it's completely connected to, the, to scalar patterns. So what, we can, what can we do with the scale and this, the, the concept of, uh, of uh, suspension? So this is, these are two, two uh, examples of uh, how canons were used to play with and to learn basics. I think most of this stuff was, was used very much in the beginning of the curriculum. Definitely the case with, uh, with Sabatini's book. I mean, you can see it that it, that was for, for beginners because it's all basic concepts. But it's also here, I think the in the case of the Neapolitan uh, conservatories, we know that all the students taught younger students. And this is particularly something that strikes me as, as uh, a set of materials that uh, may have been used for, for this kind of uh, uh, yeah, learning from older to younger students. Now this is this is how how it all starts. Then I think this the subject of canon did not disappear or or it was not only in the beginning. If you look at Martini's teaching, for example, you see that Martini uh, he wrote an awful lot of canons, and uh, some of them were extremely complicated. So it seems that canon was something that was also used for advanced composers to show their skills. It was a learned, a learned tradition, definitely a learned tradition, not only in Italy, but also in Germany. Um, the uh, Mozart Atwood text, just to play off of that, has F uh, in the counterpoint, um, the second folio of the, that talks about counterpoint, one of the first things he does is has Atwood go through and write canons uh, right. at every interval, and he even has him do duplexes, and then that precedes fugue, and then he writes fugue, and then three composition. Okay. 
So I want to show you some stuff from the Martini tradition. Um, I mean, I mean, Martini's canons are still largely unstudied. There are lots of them, and uh, I don't know of any serious studies of uh, of how this all worked pedagogically. What did he do with all these canons? How were they used? Were they used in singing, only in singing, or was this a way to to learn some of the basic techniques of um, or fugue? Was it integrated into the, the teaching and learning of fugues? Yeah, and the canon is also mentioned, of course, or not only mentioned, but, but uh, it's really worked out really well in, in Martini's Esemplare, which is a fantastic uh, treatise in two volumes. This is a modern edition of it. Um, okay. And this whole treatise is full of um, examples of, uh, of great composers. Lots of compositions from Bolognese masters from the 17th century. Lots of stuff by Palestrina, uh, Constanzo Festa, and that kind of you know, learned, learned school of composition that students uh, studied in score and and reflected about. Yeah. I'm not sure that this really reflects the teaching, or I don't believe it really reflects the teaching of of um, Martini's uh, how how he taught Mozart, for example. I don't think he used this book. Uh, this book is rather uh, uh, gives an insight in what students might do when they were when they were ready with their course in, in thoroughbars and in composition. So when they had written a lot of stuff already, so maybe they wrote lots of exercises in counterpoint first, and then they wrote a lot of uh, two-part fugues, then three-part fugues, four-part fugues, then four-part fugues with text, then four-part fugue with text and orchestra, and then a complete mass or a complete Dixit Dominus and the solo motet and maybe a complete, um, a complete psalm motet with choral parts, with fugues and uh, some arias and some recitatives like that. And then when they were finished with all that, then I think they started with this kind of analytical studies, really studying a uh, higher school of counterpoint with, with very good old examples to, to refine their skills even more. Now, this is the very first beginning of Martini's teaching. If you see what he does in the bass, it's an F clef and, uh, and um, the things he writes in the F clef, they may surprise us. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there are no explanations. What did he do with this? <laughs> One might wonder. Yeah. I think what this is all about is, is uh, this is the basics of making counterpoint in two parts. Uh, you have to make a counterpoint over this bass. Um, and you do it on the keyboard, no instructions given, uh, no, no explanations in text, but just do it. So something like this. Maybe you make some skips in the melody, melody, not only steps. And if you make a skip, which skips can you make? And, and uh, how can you make it sound good, as good as possible? 
And maybe you start with whole note against whole note, and then maybe you put two half notes on the place of one whole note. Yeah. It's really basic counterpoint, but it's practical. Yeah? And there are no books, only a bass line. Yeah? And you start to do this in all keys. So you do a lot of basic exercises in G, in D, in B, in F. It's all quite similar. Yeah, so a kind of, yeah, in, in the Renaissance, you would call this contrapunctus simplex, simple counterpoint. Until we reach page 18. And here we start to, to put together more, more parts. <laughs> And then you start to play cadences. Now this was maybe something done by ear. So the teacher is playing and you're just imitating. Huh? Imitating and, and, uh, and playing. Huh? Maybe two keyboards in the same room. Master was playing and the teacher was imitating. And you, and you start to vary these, these uh, cadential patterns. That's the reason why he gives so many of them. And one in F, one in C, they will be all different. You know? So there will be lots of variations coming and the student learns how to make the variations. So this is the way they actually start the playing and the learning of counterpoint. One other interesting thing, if I, if I enlarge this a little bit, take a look at this. You see, Marti, this is Martini's handwriting. He writes a very small annotation. C-O-R, O-P, 4, S-O, 4. Means Corelli, Opus 4. It's a collection of trio sonatas and sonata number four. Okay, so this is a reference to a certain piece by Arcangelo Corelli, where this cadence appears. And interestingly enough, Corelli's trio sonatas are two voices in, on top, two violins, and one bass line. Yeah? And then you have the reference to the, to the thoroughbass pattern, so you can see, okay, what did Corelli do with that? Okay, you get a good example. And then you say, okay, what can I do with this example? Can I vary it? Can I make my own variation now? Can I alter this into my own stuff? And probably Martini would give examples of that too. So there are lots of, lots of uh, references. So this, this uh, beginner's book by Martini, I have, uh, I have made an edition of that. This is the Martini Libro per Accompagnare. And in the appendix of this edition, I have tried to figure out all these references by Martini. So you get a little photo and then the transcription of what is, uh, what is said on the photo and then what piece it refers to, yeah? which allows us as modern users to actually go to the, to the Corelli Sonata and see, ah, okay, here it is. And he's like, ah, okay, great. Here we have a good example. So we get good examples of three-part textures um, as, and with authentic ideas of how to make the realizations, yeah? which is really valuable because there's not so much authentic material there's a lot of uh, thoughts in modern books, but there's not so much in, in contemporary sources. Now, this just goes on and on and on, and it, this is extremely valuable material. You can learn a lot from these uh, exercises by just playing and varying all of this. 
And you see how extensive this is. I'm playing cadences like this. And you've heard this many, many times, but then make all the variations on them. How would they sound? And in many cases, uh, Martini writes alio modo, or in another way, you can do it like this too. Huh? And then another one, alio modo, another way. You see, alio modo. Here you have another, this is sequence, fourth down, up a, up a second. And you get one basic pattern, and then you get another way. And then in minor, Etc. Etc. Uh, with all these references to Corelli, this this becomes a an extremely important source of information for for learning the basics of counterpoint on the keyboard. I mean, there are probably not so much rules going on here. You don't learn the rules, but you learn to do it on the keyboard. And you can already imagine what's going on. If you see certain patterns, you know, okay, I would do this because you've already practiced it on the keyboard. Yeah? So in modern terms, if, if we would say, what's going on here? In modern terms, we would say imitation, keyboard playing, yeah? putting the hands on the right spots. So like figuring out fingerings, what is easiest to play, but also oral skills, basics and counterpoint, knowledge about keys, knowledge about basic knowledge about modulations. I mean, sort of that, that kind of stuff, but not so much more. So it's not like a thick book of rules in counterpoint. That's not the way they start, but it's rather practical training. And the Italians called it actually contrapunto pratico. This is practical counterpoint. I will show you also some exercises of one of Martini's students, Stanislao Mattai, who was the teacher of Rossini and the teacher of Donizetti. Um, it looks quite similar. He also uses scales, lots of different versions. So he could write alio modo here also. Another way to do it. Here he writes actually the old scale with five three six three six three five three five three six three six three or the modern scale with six four three six three six five five three six six five and also the modern descending and then for every key martini gives four small pieces which are really lovely and uh, just to give you one example of those I could play number two for you. Let's see if I can show it a little bit bigger. So I use this in my own teaching. So I, I, I give a transcription of these pieces to my students. They will have the baseline and I will play I will play uh, two upper parts, almost like a Corellian trio sonata. Okay, so I will have two upper voices going on and the students will need to try and memorize what I will be doing as a melody on top over the bass, but also, and that's more intricate, uh, to try and figure out the middle line between the upper line and the bass line. Now, if you hear these pieces and you hear them play, then you see, ah, oh, there are lots of patterns going on, lots of basic patterns. So if you can figure out one pattern, it's often going on like one, two, three, four bars, or maybe three bars, and then there's a cadence coming. So this limited amount of uh, material allows us to memorize, to imitate, and to learn counterpoint. And that's also a way to ground the writing of counterpoint by means of practical playing. Yeah, so this could sound something like this. And the 
pattern I was showing up. Now, it, it looks more difficult than what it actually sounded, didn't it? See that? And so it, it looks, I mean, it looks as if there is a lot of information, but it's actually a descending scale and, uh, and a syncopated voice in the middle. And of course, these two voices can be flipped around and you could, you could do something like this. way to to start it okay etc etc so martini and uh, and matai are two of the of, of the very important pedagogues of uh, of uh, counterpoint and fugue in italy um, in naples we have already seen uh, sala and i i want to show you also his contrapuntal stuff, which is really interesting. This is a collection of Sala's Partimenti, which is actually an autograph. Here is one example. In the case of Sala, we're very, very lucky because he is, as far as I know, the only counterpoint master who, uh, of whom we have uh, no less than three autographs of his partimenti, which is really, really good. And that stimulated me to make a, a modern edition of, of the Sala pieces. So we have uh, these in actually in three volumes, first volume of 100 pieces and the second volume of another 89 pieces and then the third volume is uh, a critical apparatus to show exactly what i've done this one that i'm showing on the screen now is number 107 i think i just want to show you something about the about the beauty of this this kind of uh, stuff Interestingly, we see here also the cadential pattern to start with. Yeah. You find here in bar two and bar three, uh, clearly a, a, a sequential pattern. I mean, it's the same pattern repeated one step lower with the same figures. You see that? Okay, then it continues. A switch of clef to the tenor clef. Here's a new sequential pattern and then a cadence. This is still in the C clef, so this is a C and then a B. And here is the first point at which the theme, if we call it a theme, where the theme arrives in the main key. And from here, the rhythms become very much more boring, if we could say. There's much less going on. And that urges us to, to see, aha, maybe this point when we arrive at the cadence, that could be a point where the, actually the theme of, of bar one enters as a, an upper voice, yeah, which, which means that this might be combinable as a kind of double counterpoint material with this bar. And if that is true, maybe it is even through the other way around. Maybe this theme could be the theme that is used as the melody on top of this start. Okay, let's see if that works. Now I have to read on two spots at the same time, you see? I need to read this as the melody and I read, need to read this as the bass. Let's see if I can read it like that. Here 
hear it. It goes. But maybe I could enter a middle voice. And I make some kind of Corellian texture of this, right? Okay, can I remember the bass line from bar one and put it on top here? remember what I did previously and if I practiced a lot I could maybe also make variations so when the theme returns in a new key I could actually make small small variations so it will sound fresh in the new key now you see how double counterpoint is applied and this is all training to to become fluent in, in the subject of double counterpoint, which is really needed if you want to start to write fugues. Yeah. Now, this, these are a few, a few examples of how counterpoint really was a practical subject, where oral skills were integrated, where the subject of carnal was integrated, where singing was integrated, where analysis was integrated. And keyboard playing was integrated. Thorobos was integrated. And I think also analysis. And especially in this kind of stuff, it's really you, you need to learn to see. There are no instructions. So it's really also lessons in analysis. And of course, these baselines could appear as baselines in, in Motet. So if you just look at a score, and you start to analyze a score, then you will have a lot of help of learning these things. When you've trained it with Partimenti, you can already see a lot of things through the baselines of, uh, of uh, sacred works, for example. Okay, I think maybe at this point I could open for, for some questions or reactions or... Yeah, that was an awesome presentation, Professor. Uh, and thank you so much for that. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, uh, it's a great idea to open up for questions and uh, answers. I have a few questions myself, but why don't we go ahead and uh, open the floor to other people who might have questions first. In your editions of the Martini, do you include commentary for um, the, the teaching and learning of those uh, exercises? Well, there is a, there is a, a foreword, an introduction, a preface, uh, where I explain quite a lot about how I think this worked, um, but not much more than that. So it's really, I mean, it's, it's the same for me. It's really um, um, learning by doing. Now you start to, I mean, the, the Corelli references are, are a great help, of course, but uh, I think you, you learn, the more you play, the more you learn. Mm. So I, I, I'm just doing these things and I'm integrated it into, into my teaching. I learn more things all the time to, to see how I, can, how I can make more variations. And I, I also learn from scores because I see, ah, this was in that exercise. Now I see what he does in the score, you know? So mm. it's, a, it's a matter of doing it, I think. Well, thank you. Well, first of all, Professor, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, 
I had, uh, so I actually have two questions. First of all, um, in the Salvatini, um, the solmization part, um, when the new accidentals are introduced, yep. it seems like the syllables are always in in do, like what we would call movable do. Like you have the B flat coming in and like, so it's like moving to um, um, fa, uh, fa major, um, but you still have the B flat named as fa, as if it were like the, the lower fourth degree. Is that is that how it worked then? The like the was there this distinction between movable and fixed dough? Uh, and were they always doing all the scales in do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, no matter like the key that they were in? Yeah, excellent question. This is a, this is a difficult question because already at this time in, in the 18th century, there were more than one system going on. Fixed dough was certainly something that you can already find, especially in France. Um, there is a French, there's an Italian book um, by Fausto Fritelli, who explains the French fixed dough tradition. Uh, and that was already, I think, in, in the 1740s. Um, Sabatini reflects the, the old Italian way of doing it. So with uh, with uh, movable dough, okay. so so it's a movable dough tradition, and this is also what uh, what um, Martini teaches. And so, but back but, then? but I, I I must I must say that if you if you want to get into the details of that, you really need to 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 get this book, the Solfeggio Tradition by Nicholas Baragonath. Baragonath. He, he's done a tremendous job of figuring out the details of all this thank you so much yeah. um and if you don't mind professor i have another question of course. um so i saw especially in the second method and then in the martini that they're it's they're basically a, like a collection a very vast collection of canons but mm, as you said there are little to no explanations so was this like, was the pro the canonic process explained by the teacher, or did they just have to figure it everything out, or is there any like supplementary methods where they explain how a canon works and you know what a leader is, what a follower is, or are they just like presented, or do they just face this music and like have to figure out all the mechanisms by themselves? There were of course uh, treatises. So especially in, in Naples, there were old treatises from the from the uh, from the 17th century that explain in detail how canons were were both written and improvised. And my suspicion is that they still used uh, some of these old treatises for the instruction of of canon techniques. But it's true what you say. I, th I think there. You see from the materials that there was a lot of practical instruction going on. Uh, you have to remember that the Neapolitan conservatories, especially before 1750, had the, the very best teachers in Italy. Uh, that, that were the, the, the great names. I mean, Durante, he was played all over Europe. Yeah? Alessandro Scarlatti, of course, he's known still. Um, Leonardo Leo, he was a major figure in, in Italy. So, we have to do with the, the most outstanding teachers in Italy. So, of course, I think they, they, they instructed their students step by step. They were probably very good pedagogues because the level was very, very high. So, but, um, but any detail, uh, it would be wonderful to have some YouTube clips from that time, but we don't have them. <laughs> Um, uh, thank you so much, Professor. First, actually, I, I have some questions about your book. Yeah. Uh, from your book that I'd love to talk about. So, um, there's some very interesting things that you talk about between the differences of the Durant School and Leo School. 
Uh, one of those things actually I thought was really fascinating on a mechanical issue, and this I'm asking this question because it's actually going to relate to our study of cannons and contrary motion either today or next week. It will probably be next week. Um, and that is, is one of the schools defined minor seven sand, the tritone, as a natural, natural consonance or a type of consonance that does not require preparation. And then you talk about how the French later came in and they, they called that natural dissonance. Um, and so we have this distinction between artificial and natural dissonance. And so I would love if you talked more about that, where you think that thinking came from, how the tritone can be a con can be understood as a consonance that does not require preparation. So what do you think are the justifications or the origins of that? And can you go into that a little bit more? Yeah, I can just speculate about it, but uh, you find the first, uh, the very first uh, examples of that kind of things already in the 17th century. So I, I don't necessarily think that this is has to do with with Rameau um, and Rameau's uh, uh, fundamental base principles and so on. Uh, that's often a connection that is um, that is made. But I think this was already in the air, so to speak, in, in especially the modern ones, the modern composers who were experimenting a little bit what they could do and what they thought sounded well. More exactly what, what was going on and when and how did it arrive there and so on. Mm, that's very difficult. Mm. One theory that I've seen uh, that was discussed in a book by Professor Kendall Doral Briggs at Juilliard actually is he says that this idea of natural dissonance is derived from the harmonic series. So that the tritone and the dominant seventh is found in the, nat in the harmonic series. And so yeah. for them, the justification was that it's acoustically already there, so why do we have to prepare it? Uh, and that's, I guess that's why the French called it natural dissonance. Exactly, yes. Yeah, um, and it's very fascinating to see that that, con that concept, con I, I did not know actually existed so early as, as you mentioned. Yeah. Um, so that's, it's a very interesting distinction that these schools have between Durant and Leo about their definitions of dissonance. Um, which there, there's, there's all, even today, there are, there are disagreements on what the nature of dissonance is. Yeah. Um, so do you have anything you want to talk about regarding what, how, you, how the schools differed in their definitions of dissonance and treatment? I, I think that the, the most important difference in, between these two schools, the, the, the more forward-looking school of Durant and the more backward-looking school of Leo, it's, so, it's all very difficult because when I say more forward-looking school of Durante, at the same time, we have to remember that in Solfeggio, it was the other way around. In Solfeggio, Durante was more old-fashioned than Leo was. In Partimento, it was rather... Um, uh, Leo, who was more old-fashioned, and Durante was more modern. So it seems as if you, you need to look at the entire curriculum. You need to see, like, okay, what did they do in, in Solfeggio? What did they do in, in Partimento? And how was Partimento used as a preparation for composition or for written counterpoint and composition? Then you see, okay, if you, if you want to write a lot of good melodies, then you need a then you need the Partimento tradition, which learns you to make melodies over bass lines all the time. Yeah? So not so much double counterpoint, not so much working from subjects, because if you work from subjects, then you want to switch the parts and then you're working with double counterpoint. Yeah? So if you want to make good melodies, then you, you will automatically uh, turn in, uh, have to do with a, a Partimento school, which becomes a little bit more, more focused on modulation, on melody, on dramaturgy, on uh, working with opera and, uh, and, and drama and see how you can move things with switch, with, with, with uh, fast modulations and, uh, you know, it's a really operatic, operatic uh, accompagnamento and, uh, and that's what you see in Durante. But at the same time, Durante also needed the tradition. So probably he used solfeggio to compensate for what was lost 
in Partimanto. Huh? And in the school of, of Leo, it was the other way around. Leo wanted his students to become very good in improvising fugues, sketching fugues in Partimanto style, and to become fluent in making a beautiful uh, four part fugue written in a short amount of time. And a lot of time was consumed in learning that. Uh, so they, they would not become as, as fluent in making melodies as the, the School of Dorante would, but, but then Leo would use the solfeggi to compensate for what was lost by focusing entirely on double counterpoint and fugue in Partimento teaching. Uh, so that's really a, a, it's really a mix of old and new in both schools. You know? Yeah, a, a really fascinating difference that comes up that your, your book talks about that I actually found a little bit funny was uh, this debate over the fourth, uh, which, you know, actually we, we place a lot of emphasis on it in our counterpoint studies today. Uh, clearly, they didn't, they, they thought it was kind of trifling. Um, and there's this, there's this very interesting thing in here, actually, which I think is, I think is actually very indicative of maybe the limits of the purely intervallic approach to dissonance and counterpoint. Uh, but you, you, you mentioned that some of them said that the fourth over the second scale degree, if I understand right, was not totally understood as dissonance. At least what we would say is a passing uh, dominant chord in a true second inversion. Uh, so yeah. maybe something like, you know, where, where the bass goes like that. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's very that's very surprising, I think, for students to hear actually today, because we're, we're we're taught oh the fourth is the fourth is distance, and we can't have that yeah. distance with the bass. But it's it's not actually true historically. Yeah. Um, and we but see it, that in all the repertoire. Yeah. But if you remember the the picture I showed in from Mattai, he actually showed also the modern scale, uh, and that the old scale was the scale without the fourth on the second. Huh? And the modern was was the one with the fourth. So yeah. there you see really the old and the new traditions, and and the different views on, on on uh, whether the the fourth was was considered a consonance or a dissonance. Yeah. And now another thing I wanted to also point out was in your book. I think this is so important because you talk about the schedule that these students had. And I think it's really important to talk about this because there's a really beautiful thing happening right now where there's like this, this renaissance, the second renaissance happening in the Partimento tradition where you, know, you have Facebook groups dedicated to this, you have classes cropping up, it's an elective course now in, uh, in, in, in schools and everything. And as you've observed with that happens, when, when that happens, of course, you know, all this information starts flying around and it doesn't always get you know, taken care of, uh, but the enthusiasm is great. Um, but the schedule talks about, you know, you have, you have ear training, you have instrumental skills, you have the partimento, which is, uh, improvisation at the keyboard, but also you point out that counterpoint, written counterpoint and composition is a separate class, which is, I think, an important distinction to make. Um, and that, that's just having this holistic experiment, uh, experience that you need to have, you need to have good instrumental chops, you need to have good ears, and improvisation, improvisation is a great approach to maybe the wealth of invention of the mind, but also counterpoint as a study and a compositional study is not purely uh, improvised, though it is enhanced by it. Um, and so I, I think that's, I think that's something that as Partimental becomes more popular, it has to, I, I don't know if you want to speak to this, but it has to keep in mind that holistic exper experience, at least. Like if you take, if you're taking a partimental class without taking a counterpoint class and getting your chops up orally and instrumentally, uh, what are you going to get at the end? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I think, um, well, I have to correct you on one thing. I, I don't think they had an ear training class mm -hmm. because uh, ear training was rather a subject that was everywhere. Mm -hmm. It was in the in the in the counterpoint class, and it was in the departmental class, and it was in the in the singing class as well. Yeah? So the, we tend to talk about the subject of solfeggio, 
But if you look carefully in the sources, then it's often called canto. It's singing. Yeah? So the pieces, when you look at the collection of pieces, then they are called solfeggi. Yeah? So you see solfeggi on the, on, the, on the front page. Okay, what are you doing in your singing class? I'm doing solfeggi, <laughs> mm. right? But the subject was probably called canto, I think. And it's the same with ear training. Ear training was not a class. It was a method of learning, and that was everywhere. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, yeah, thank, thank you for pointing that out. Um, yeah. yeah, and the other thing that we're going to talk about in this club, so the reason why we start with canon um, is that when we get to fugue, later we ask this question, are fugue subjects discovered or are they designed? Um, so that's, that's something that we use for the, uh, for the canon. So, yeah, uh, I, I'm wondering if you have any th ideas on how the Ustredi technique and, because you talked about how is the canon taken into the, uh, the, the fugue or whatnot. Um, so yeah, that's it. One, one thing that we say in this club also is that the, the fugue and everything else can be understood almost as the free application of the canonic process. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, very good question. I, I, I think uh, it is uh, dangerous to generalize um, on this. I, I think, I, I suspect that there were differences between the maestri in Naples. If you, if you look at the times, time span between 1740 and 1770, 1780, you would probably find a number of different attitudes towards subjects or uh, or canon or fugue um, sala is the one who who whom i i have studied the most and what has intrigued me in in looking at sala and all the stuff that sala uh, did with his students I've, I've looked at all the counterpoint notebooks by the students of sala and as far as i know i've I don't think I've ever seen him repeat any subject. I think there's one, one subject that has reappeared. And I'm not sure that, what the reason was, but of the maybe 1,000 or 1,500 subjects that I've encountered, they're all different. You know? And I've looked careful, carefully at them. Um, so I think in the case of Sala, I think it was a language of making for every lesson he had with a student. I mean, I mean, maybe he had two lessons a week. He made a new subject for every lesson. No? So now, and, and I think he he could do it like in in one minute. He had a few, he had a, and after having worked with Sala's music, you could almost start to think in the same way. I could almost make a, a Sala subject. I mean, I know how he does that. And, and they're, they're, they're all different, but there they're, are also similarities. So it's a, it's a language, it becomes a language. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you for those, uh, those brilliant answers. Um, I think also Juan had a question. Yes, actually, uh, I was uh, just going to uh, um, I, I wanted to ask a question on what Erickson and uh, you, Professor, just were talking about. Um, this, you know, whether um, fugue subjects are invented or engineered, so to speak. And I'm, I'm wondering whether, you know, with the, in the subjects by Sala, um, these subjects have different properties. Like, for example, some, are, some, some of them are invertible. Or some of them are like work in augmentation. Some of them, you know, are more suited to work in with like certain mechanisms. And uh, like how, like how would he engineer this? You know, he, he had like you said more than one hundred subjects, and all of them except for one were different. I wonder like if they were showcasing different properties of counterpoint. You know, like. Mm -hmm. Uh, double ca double cannon or like um, inversion or country motion or things like that. 
Yeah, I don't. I can't. I can't answer that uh, right away. I, I, I haven't analyzed it in that way uh, so accurately. So I think maybe it's possible to find answers to these questions, but I don't have that. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. That means they're good questions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, the other thing I would love to show you, actually, because you, you brought up this idea of improvised canons, um, is that Juan and I have actually been working on this. And I'm going to put the poor guy on the spot because he's much better at this than I am. You know, he's he's pianist and taught ear training. So Juan is actually an amazing improviser as well. He's been able to improvise fugues since he was like 16. Uh, so he's he is a wonderful musician that we're very lucky to have in the club. And so consequently. I make him do all the hard stuff, and I just okay. I, I, I take a seat back and I very good uh, and I, I watch him do it. And so that's but I get to teach and I get all the attention, so it works out. Um, but one of the things that we're doing now with our musicianship uh, training, which I find immensely helpful, is that we're we're doing this improvised canon kind of thing, and what we do is I I provide a. Uh, Pretty much one line, and what he, what we do, and what he does far better than I do, um, is we play it with one hand and we sing it with the other. Uh, one second, actually. All right. So here is an example, um, and this can be done in any key, of course. Um, but this, this is done in C major, so. And so what the student would do is they would play it with the right hand, and then they would sing it or solfege it and, and canon with it, and then they would ornament it. And then, if possible, we need, we need to practice this is add a free left hand part. And it's amazing the practice that this does when it, it really just makes your ear hear into the canon, and you really hear the nexus of counterpoint that is unfolding. You become much faster, and what's also great, because you talked about memory, you know, you have to memorize. You have to memorize what you did like a minute ago, and this really helps your short-term memory because it's actually really hard to remember what you ornamented just one bar earlier. So Absolutely. You can, yeah, and you, and you can increase the, uh, the the number of measures of the imitation as well. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put Juan on the spot. I'm going to have him walk through the whole thing. All right. So just go through the stages, Juan. So this is what we're doing with our ear training now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Fantastic. Absolutely, and so then, and then we gradually add a, a third free voice. But this is the kind of work that we started doing in our ear training. Uh, that's connected, and it's it's quite amazing what it does for your ear. And I just thought I'd bring that up because you, you mentioned improvising these canons. Of course, at one point we would not have the written aid anymore. Uh, but this this has been the approach that we're using. So we're integrating the canonic approach with our ear training and composition and everything like that. So, yeah. Fantastic. This is also intriguing that it's actually an integration of diminution practice, mm -hmm. right? So what what figures can you make on one? I mean, this could be whole notes too, and uh, you could it could all, almost be become diminution examples of diminution counterpoint. Yeah, um, absolutely. Well, yeah, that, that leads me to another thing that we do in this club, which is very helpful. Uh, also, that's drunk bomb. We do tipsy cannons. Um, but this is an example of, I call these wireframes. Um, and so here is.
So that's a kind of wireframe that we use. And so what students do is they take this and then they ornament it. So here's a realization of a wireframe, the one that I just played. Um, And so that's what we do is practice in these clubs. And they're very useful, actually, because they, they impose also upon the student a certain structure or form. Uh, so all the wires obey that the first two measures end in a uh, imperfect authenticators. This says perfect authenticators. That's a mistake. Um, that it has a modulation halfway through. They're all eight bars. And that the conclusion ends with the perfect authenticators and the dominant. Because I believe pedagogically that the canon, there's actually no mastery of the canon unless you can manipulate it to do what you want it to do when you want it to do it, which is why the imposition of form is actually the indication of true mastery of canon. Because, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you can write canons and they can turn out to be 13 bars long and they don't modulate and they can bully you and they can, you know, kick you around the block. Um, and, how, and how do you find the wireframes? Are you, are you making them through reverse engineering from real pieces or? No, um, the wireframes have many parameters. Well, first, it's this very basic idea, actually, that in the Renaissance, we, we can read in Chanto so we leave uh, seeing on the book, this idea of if you have a canon at the, uh, at the unison, um, you know, you can go down a third. And so you have these goals. And you talked about this earlier. You said, if you go down a third, and then you can just get there. You have goals. The other yeah. person just needs to do that. And so all these are very goal-oriented. This is down a third up a third, down a fifth. Now this goes up a fourth, which of course whenever you do that, you have to have passing tones. Um, so first they're all goal oriented and then they traverse the goals and they, 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 they attain those. Um, the other thing is that each canon, these, these are very strictly designed. So every dyad after the first two beats has to be different so that it has forward motion. Um, otherwise it sounds stagnant. So every downbeat has to be a different combination of two notes. The other thing is that the outer voices have to form uh, imperfect consonances, otherwise approached by oblique or contrary motion. So the outer voices always form thirds and sixths. And so that, that really enhances the sonority of, and the, the acoustic um, resonance of the canon, although that's not, of course, present in the repertoire, but these are meant to be pedagogical, so they're, they're incredibly strict. Uh, but that's how the canons are designed, to have different dyads on every downbeat, so it has forward motion, imperfect consonances with the outer voices, eight bars long, first two measures are imperfect authentic cadence, perfect authentic cadence, everything is the same form, and also this requirement of notoric counterpoints, um, starting on the third bar. So that's how these are designed, and they take into account Practices that you're talking about, diminution, variation. You talk, you talk about mm -hmm. here, article. But you, you make these yourself. Yeah, I make these myself. Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. Um. So yeah, yeah. It's just it's it's fast. These the, there's lots of approaches, and I you know trying to teach the club. Of course, I feel like there's there's no other approach that you can actually have other than this kind of diminution approach because I guess the pedagogues back then. They must have run into the same challenges that I run into in the club uh, because you, you reach the same solutions in how to teach it, yeah. um, which is fascinating. Yeah. So yeah, that's what we do in this club. There are some, there is an, an interesting chapter in, in uh, Louis, Ludovico Zacconi's uh, Pratica Musica, which explains the rules for improvised canon mm -hmm. uh, step by step. for. I think for seven or eight different forms of Kano. And he explains each and each and every one of them. So that's a very interesting source for the earlier. I mean, it's a lot earlier than, than what we saw with Sala, but it's really the origin in, in, the, in the Renaissance where this is explained. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's really fascinating stuff how this, how, how amazingly helpful the study of Kano is. Um, Okay, well, are there any other questions 
for a professor or shall we call it a day? No, I I could uh, I could send you the 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 yeah. details of these uh, editions if you if any one of you are interested in in ordering these you can contact me I can help you with the details of it. Yeah, I can provide a Professor Van Tor's uh, contact information, yeah. also directly the link for these things. I've got them, they're amazing. Yeah. Um, I've been able to read through them. Um, they're, they're very well written, very understandable, very helpful. Yeah. So I highly recommend them. And this one's and the, excellent. The Mufti pieces, the, this one is coming out in, I think within three or four weeks. I'm doing the final proofreading right now. I wow. think it should be ready soon. That's very exciting. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much for uh, joining us. And I hope you'll join us again in the future as we get to other subjects like uh, Fugue. Um, With pleasure. Was, yeah, yeah. And it was, it, was such a, it was such a treat and privilege to have you join us. Um, thank you. Yeah, yeah. My pleasure. Okay. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so with that, we'll call it a day. And uh, next week, we're at, we'll cover canons and contrary motion. And uh, Professor, you are always welcome to drop by um, if you ever want to join us and let us pick your brain. brain so, thank you. Huh? Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Have a bye. good day, everybody. <laughs>